Kyle Larson's out of championship purgatory, Shane Van Gisbergen punted another rugby ball into the grandstands, and Joseph Newgarden might be turning into Homelander from the boys. Welcome back to the Break Hard Show. I'm Matt. Yeah, this weekend in, well, racing, we had a lot of things to talk about. We're going to start with the NASCAR Cup Series race at Sonoma on Sunday because Kyle Larson returned from championship purgatory this weekend and responded by winning the race, his third NASCAR Cup Series win of the season, tying him with Denny Hamlin and William Byron for the most this season. He also reclaimed the regular season points lead as well, which he had lost when he missed the Coke 600 to go race the Indy 500. Kind of easy to do, though, because Denny Hamlin went kablamo on lap two. Kind of handed that to Larson. And then Martin Truex Jr. ran out of gas at the end of the race, coming to the finish line, and went from second all the way back into the 20s. And that really hurt his points day as well. We would see, you know, Martin Truex Jr., trying to limp to the start finish line as the booth was yelling at us that he was out of gas but the fox cameras were too busy looking at a group of guys wearing american flag overalls in the grandstands because that added a lot to the end of the race apparently this race was really weird and actually probably one of the best gen 7 races on a road course that we've seen certainly the best race we've seen at sonoma in quite some time Uh, the last 20 laps were super intriguing the race started with just these guys loving to run into one another. Denny Hamlin blows up early in the race. Ty Gibbs doesn't rage quit this week, but he does clip the inside wall with his right front in the new hairpin uh, wall area. The crash is going off into turn one. His day was ruined from that point on. Austin Sendrick thought about doing his best Steve Park impression. Thankfully, he didn't. Off into turn one right there. He survived uh, to continue on racing. Chase Briscoe spun out in the S's and he was sitting broadside, which was not ideal. Thankfully, he didn't get hit broadside, but he did clip the 22 of Joey Logano and it ripped the whole rear bumper and everything off of that 14 car. And he went back to the pits. They were able to bear bond that back together. Logano was really good early. Obviously, uh, he started on the front row and then doesn't. He tried to flip the stage, get stuck back in traffic. And, you know, when you hang out, uh, with the squirrels enough, eventually you catch a nut or something along those lines. I have no idea what that saying is. But for Logano, he ended up having a bad day after going back into the pack like that. So for him, unfortunate end to his day, or his chances of winning, rather, were pretty much doomed from that point on. Late in stage two, we had a really interesting battle between Kyle Larson and Tyler Reddick. Uh, for what would eventually be the race lead. And again, the Fox cameras decided to look at everything that wasn't Kyle Larson and Tyler Reddick. Really infuriating. We had a nice landscape shot. We had a nice shot of just empty racetrack, which was lovely. I mean, racetracks are very photogenic. Just we'd prefer to see the actual on-track action uh, when possible. Josh Berry got punted by Aaron Jones getting down into the turn 11 hairpin area and bowled a perfect strike like he was pete weber the who do you think you are i am guy everybody's favorite bowler from that point on i don't think anybody else knows a bowler other than pete weber so yeah the first bit of this race was chaotic to say the least but then in the final stage you had different strategies the five and the nine were kind of on their own strategy and cliff daniels made a great call he knows who his driver is and basically gave him uh fresh tires and enough fuel to make it to the end, and with 20 laps to go, well, maybe a tick over, told Kyle Larson to, you know, go catch the leaders. He had an eight-second gap that he was going to have to make up to both Chris Buescher and Martin Truex Jr., and he does it. The booth kept being like, oh, he's going to get there with eight laps to go. He got there with 12. Martin Truex Jr. then gets by Chris Buescher, which Larson followed him through, and then Larson set uh, MTJ up in that same lap and also passed him, takes the lead, drives away. He wins the race. Truex would have finished second, does not. He fades after running out of fuel and then had the strongest starter we've seen in the Cup Series in quite some time. We have seen this happen before where guys will bump the car across the line just using the starter motor, uh, but strong battery, strong starter in that 19 car for Martin Truex Jr. Michael McDowell comes home second. A uh, great result for, for him. Uh, obviously he's talked after the race and he's like, we need to win. And that's true. Like he has to absolutely win. And his chances are, you know, becoming slimmer as road courses and now super speedways. The remaining ones, obviously he does have a chance for Daytona still, uh, which is the penultimate race in the regular season. But then Atlanta and Talladega will both be in the playoffs. So he really has to bank on Daytona, Chicago street course um, to hopefully maybe help him get into 
the playoffs. But for Larson, I mean, last week he raced at Gateway not knowing if he was still championship eligible for the driver's championship at least. NASCAR finally came to their senses, granted him a waiver earlier in the week, and now he's back into the championship and gained more championship points on Sunday for the playoffs. And honestly, I think Kyle Larson has asserted himself probably as the best road course racer in the Gen 7 era, probably the best at the moment on road courses. Chase Elliott, still phenomenal in his own right. Tyler Reddick, still super strong as well. But Kyle Larson on road courses has certainly become, you know, a norm. You expect to see him up front at this point. Unfortunate for our Aussie friends that came over and joined us, Cam Waters and Will Brown, both of them were storming towards the top 10 early in this race. They were very fast, the 33 of Will Brown, the 60 of Cam Waters. Um, Cam got caught up in an incident, ruined his day. Will Brown uh, got limped off track, and then NASCAR held him a lap for what they said was cutting the track. I don't... I get it. I understand it. Uh, it's the, it's the rule. He didn't necessarily cut the track, but he did cut back through the hairpin area and then go into pit lane because he was having some sort of mechanical issue there. He finishes three laps down, both of them back into the 30s. Not ideal. Zane Smith finally had a really good run. Looked like he might, you know, be on pace for a top 15. He comes from 16th. Corey LaJoy had another good run as well. He's become formidable on road courses, which is a great thing for for him and that Spire team. He unfortunately did not get a top 10 finish. He still has zero top 10 finishes on non-drafting tracks, but he did come home P11, which is a really strong run for him. So overall, this race in Sonoma, was I gave it like an 83, 83 to 85. Super intriguing race. Love the different strategy for a repave. It was actually pretty entertaining. Would still love to have more tire fall off, absolutely. But overall, not a bad race whatsoever. The Xfinity race on Saturday night, if you stayed up on the East Coast because it was an 8 p.m. start time, uh, prime time Xfinity on FS1, Shane Van Gisbergen picks up his second Xfinity Series win in a row. That was easy money. If you were going to place a bet, I did. Placing on SVG was just like, give me the cash right now because he went out there and won just like you expected him to. It did involve a late race restart. He had already caught Austin Hill. He was going to pass Austin Hill. Uh, He was forcing Austin into mistakes. Caution comes out for Jesse Love sitting broadside uh, in that run down to the hairpin. I get why they threw it. Probably could have waited. A local yellow probably would have sufficed there if NASCAR utilized them. But it sets up a late race restart. He goes ahead and, you know, picks the outside going through turn one, which would be the inside at the top of the hill right there. That being SVG. Austin Hill does not leave him a lane when they get to the top of the hill there, even though SVG is there. So Shane did what Austin would have done that situation, which was give him a hip check. Let him survive. Didn't wreck him. Austin probably would have wrecked him. SVG goes on to win the race. Uh, Austin Hill gets swallowed up and obviously is out of contention at that point. Shane then on his cooldown lap does what he now is tradition. Uh, he did it down in supercars. He's now brought it over to NASCAR and that's doing like a full lap drift after the race. And he's drifting around Sonoma and he's doing it right behind <laughs> right behind Austin Hill like this is a Formula D event and he gets points for being close to the competitor in front of him Austin Hill was not pleased about it did flip him off at one point I thought he was going to break check him he was trying to run away from the 97 of Shane Van Gisbergen but SVG was just not letting him get away which again laugh out loud funny don't know if he's being petty in the moment but hilarious either way after the race uh, Austin Hill predictably uh, decided that he was going to be the victim in this situation and he wasn't going to say anything because the keyboard warriors weren't going to be happy with what he was going to say regardless. And it's like uh, some, you know, self-awareness goes a long way. And I don't think Austin Hill has any of that. I probably have too much of it. Eh, I'll give him some. If you would like to have some, I will see him at Chicago and I will gift him some self-awareness. But I think it's probably better that he didn't say anything and you know, good for him for not sounding like a fool where a couple weeks ago at Charlotte, he gets out of the car after the race and he's like, Cole Custer just lost his mind down the front stretch. He caused all this. He doored me, even though Austin's the one that initiated contact there. So saying less is actually a good thing for Austin Hill and uh, Andy Petrie can go let him rant to him and they can, you know, sulk and sorrow together. But SVG after the race was like, yeah, essentially I feel like we're even now. He took one from me at Coda. I took one from him here today. You know, it's a wash. He technically did take Austin out at Coda too, but SVG is more likable at this point. So we'll side with him. On to the IndyCar race at Road America, the natural park of speed or whatever they want to call it. National Park of Speed, not natural. I don't know. It's been a long day. It's Monday morning. What do you expect? So 
Penske goes one, two, three. And that's unfortunate for, well, the series and everybody because the team owner's most powerful team in the sport going one, two, three. It's just not fun. It's just not fun. But Will Power picks up his first win since 2022. That was an awesome moment for him, his family, his wife, who obviously nearly passed away. Um, she survived. She's coming back out of it, which is great. Uh, his kid was there. So just a fun moment all around. He did not wait for NBC or Andy Carr to tell him to get out of the car in victory lane for the podium celebration. He just went ahead and hopped out. That was fantastic. Love to see just emotion like that. Joseph Newgarden finishes second. Scott McLaughlin third. Newgarden was in position to win this race. Power stayed out a lap longer than Newgarden, was able to leapfrog him in the pit stop sequence. He goes on to win the race, drove away from Newgarden there at the end. Joseph, though, gave Will a hug after the race in this blank stare, reminding me so much of Homelander from The Boys. And I was just expecting his eyes to turn into lasers and just vaporize everybody around him because he did not win. Joseph Newgarden is a villain, whether he wants to admit it or not. The race started off with a, a just banger at the start. I don't know what was going on with the Ganassi guys, but three Ganassi cars involved in incidents in the first few laps of this race. And on the start of the race, Linus Lundquist, the rookie, on pole, goes off into turn one and gets promptly spun out by his teammate, Marcus Erickson, from behind. Joseph Newgarden then punts Colton Herta out of the way as they all check up for the wreck. And Herta was furious after the race. He's like, I don't understand how that was not a penalty for avoidable contact. And on one hand, I can agree with him because the only car to get spun out there after everyone started to check up was Colton Herta. Everyone else managed to not run into the car in front of him, but Joseph Newgarden appeared to almost gas it up and plow through the 26 of Herta. And maybe he won revenge for Long Beach, where Herta ran into the back of him in the hairpin, lifting him off the ground, which then put his car into anti-stall mode for a second and allowed Herta and others pass. Maybe. I don't know. But on the other hand, I can see race control not wanting to give it because everybody is checking up for an incident that's happening in front of them. And then Herta went just over the top and was like, I think the only way you get a penalty these days is if you bring a gun and shoot somebody in the head. In the head. What the heck is going on here? A week after, we have everybody at Detroit, Santino Ferrucci, Kyle Kirkwood, Colton Herta, all throwing jabs at each other. We're now throwing jabs at race control. I, it's just maybe a tick aggressive, maybe just a little bit too aggressive there from Colton Herta, but to each their own. Other than that, IndyCar Road America remains a really good show. So uh, it looked like a great party. Once again, people absolutely love coming out there. IndyCar and Road America announced a long-term extension to continue racing at the facility for the foreseeable future. Uh, their deal is up at the end of this year, so it's 2025 and beyond, uh, which is great news for everybody because it remains one of the best road courses in America. Does NASCAR need to be there? I don't necessarily think the Cup Series ever put on a great race there, but you can make an argument for it, and the people certainly showed up for it as well, which was always fun, but that race is now on the streets of Chicago. So we'll have to wait and see how that's going to go. Speaking of Chicago, I will be there in attendance for the Xfinity and the Cup Series races as well. So if you will be there, let me know. Maybe we can have some sort of meetup as well. Formula One also raced in North America this weekend. They were up in practice France in Montreal. Hmm. <laughs> I can't really do that great uh, Pepe Le Pew type of French noise that they make. But Max Verstappen goes on to win his 50th race since 2021, which is a astronomical number of races to, to win in such a short amount of time. Granted, we do have the longest seasons ever, and he has the most dominant car Formula One's ever seen, at least last year. I do think that they are struggling right now to figure out what's going on with their car. I mean, Mercedes this week said that the upgrades for... Red Bull have essentially been downgrades. And I think that they've now adjusted their car so much to try to make these proposed upgrades work that they've just kind of lost a feel of their car. Max does win the race. Uh, George Russell was on pole. He ran a 112 flat, one minute, 12 seconds flat, which is an oddity, cool thing. And then Max promptly ran the exact same time as him. But because George said it first, he got to uh, start on pole. George led most of the race to begin with. Uh, and then his enters started to go off. Um, Max catches him, and then Lando blasts around both of them and takes the lead. And you're like, wow, Lando Norris might be en route to his second Formula One victory uh, coming in such a short amount of time to go, you know, pick up his first two. Ultimately, that didn't work out for him because a safety car does come out and where Lando benefited from the safety car at Miami, it bit him this time. He was already past pit lane entrance. Safety car picked him up. That allowed the guys behind him to pit, allowed Max to leapfrog him which was unfortunate for, for Lando. The Red Bull pit wall was very happy about it. They you know, radioed to Max and said, this is for Miami, basically, or payback for Miami. Uh, apparently, they were still very butthurt about 
that Miami Grand Prix, which they they could have just passed him still. I mean, that was still an option to catch Lando and pass him, but uh, I guess the floor damage was just too bad for Max back then. Max goes on to win the race. Ferrari did very Ferrari things once again. Charles Leclerc was in a mood all weekend. The Ferrari was just not competitive whatsoever. In the race, he's yelling at the team to tell him how much time he's losing down the straights. And they just said, oh, you know, you're losing most of your time down the straights. He's like, that's not what I asked. Tell me how much time. They're like over half a second. And then he was like, feels like more. So they bring him into pit. And they're at that moment where you're like, maybe you can make slicks work. Maybe you can put the hard tire on or the medium, make this work. So they go ahead and put him on slicks. And everybody else in the pit lane's like, it's going to rain. We can see it. We have eyes. We know it's going to rain. And Ferrari's like, no, 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 no. We're Italian. We're the best meteorologists out there. Not going to rain. So they sent him out on track and it promptly rained like everyone thought they would or thought it would. And he loses 37 seconds on his outlap, which was just pitiful to begin with. And then they finally just retire the car because he wasn't ever going to make up ground from that point on. Max goes on to win the race. Mercedes had a good battle between George Russell and Lewis Hamilton. George gets back onto the podium. So that was a great result for him. Lewis, very upset about it, did not want to hear what Toto had to say after the race. And I think he's ready to just go off to Ferrari next year because as Mercedes continues to be just kind of all over the place, they look great in free practice three, pace the session, the two of them. And then George gets pulled, which is great. But then Lewis just really didn't have anything in qualifying, qualifies P7 and comes home uh, P4, which is still a good result, but not exactly what he wanted. Said he made a lot of mistakes out there on Sunday. So overall, pretty entertaining uh, Canadian Grand Prix. Just kind of wish Max didn't win it. Moving on to the Stephen Wallace, dumb move of the week. And I'm going to have to give that out to another Nepo baby, much like Stephen Wallace. This would be Ty Gibbs because Saturday night in the Xfinity Series race at Sonoma, there was a big wreck at the top of the hill, uh, which would essentially be what, two, three, somewhere around turn three, uh, depending on however you want to number uh, the, the corners there at Sonoma. There's a big wreck. Uh, Ty gets caught up in it. And then he just goes into full rage mode. And he's got the car floor doing a huge burnout, trying to get going straight. Loops around, hits the, uh, so he spins around the nose of Brandon Jones. And then while he's rage quitting and doing this burnout and spinning around, he then spins around the nine car and the 81 right runs right into him. And he wouldn't have done that if Ty hadn't been out there trying to go absolute temper tantrum like he's Austin Hill. And unfortunately, it kind of gave Chandler more damage. He already had Chandler was able to rebound for a top 10 finish, which is great for him. But still, it wouldn't happen if Ty could just control his emotions. And then he gets out afterwards and he's like, well, you know, things just pile up and everything. It's like, no, dude, you were rage quitting right there. Nobody else is spinning the tires, doing an absolute hellacious burnout right there. But at the end of the day, I guess he's sponsored by Jesus, so it's all going to be okay. And he gets us, and maybe he needs to get out and wash Chandler's feet now or something. I don't know what those commercials are necessarily trying to tell us, but whatever. Quick rant that I have this weekend, and it, it annoys me because... I think we were all excited when the NASCAR Cup Series announced that they were going to Iowa. It's a quirky 7 8 mile racetrack, old surface, a lot of bumps, should be multiple grooves, should have been a pretty entertaining race. Well, then a little bit over a week ago, we saw the tire test there and saw that NASCAR has repaved the bottom two lanes, and that has just absolutely killed my excitement level. I said I went from a John Forrest level excitement down to a Mike Joy calling the end of the also race level excitement. Just boom, sank, which is unfortunate. So now we have to deal with this. And Jeff Gluck on the teardown Sunday after the race at Sonoma said that he asked NASCAR about this. And NASCAR said uh, essentially that they wanted to repave the whole track, but time frame wise, they didn't do it. So they just repaid the bottom two lanes between the weather in Iowa and then the time crunch that they had to get a tire test done before the race there. They decided to just repay the bottom two. Let me say this. A repave sucks. A partial repave sucks even more because now all the cars are just going to be diving to the bottom. Nobody's going to be using the top. Think about how Texas, everybody just sticks to the bottom because the top is just unraceable. It's kind of going to be the same thing here. Either repave the whole thing or don't. Now, if there's a good explanation for why it needed a repave, I just haven't seen it yet. And I'm all ears if there is a good, you know, um, explanation. Whether the surface was coming up, potentially, maybe, I don't know, or the bumps were just becoming too aggressive and it wouldn't have, you know, would have been dangerous. Okay, I can get behind all that. I just haven't seen an explanation like that yet. And now my excitement level is just kind of down. Either leave it the way it was for one more year or repave the entire thing. But a partial repave is just not the answer. Like when Pocono just partially repaved one lane in turn three and everybody hunted for that. I feel like that's exactly what we're going to see here. A tire that's not going to wear, everybody hunting for the bottom. 
Maybe it's a good thing. It's on Sunday night at 7 p.m. on USA while the U.S. Open finishes up on NBC because I just don't think it's going to be that good of a race. Yo. Looking ahead. Uh, yeah, looking ahead for this upcoming week. We have the NASCAR Cup and Xfinity Series in action at... Um, Looking ahead this upcoming week, we have the NASCAR Cup and Xfinity Series in action at Iowa. IndyCar is off until June 23rd when they return to Laguna. And Formula One is off for a fortnight, which is two weeks' time for all the people that use the standard system and not the Queen's metric system. So until then, trucks remain off, which I thought was really funny. During the broadcast this week, Fox kept being like, well, you know, our portion of the Cup and Xfinity Series schedule is done, but the trucks are on FS1 all year except for the next race, which is on FS2. But after that, all the races on FS1, they just kept saying FS1, and the graphic just kept saying FS2 for the race at Nashville, which Clint Boyer will be in as well. I think there might also be some news that uh, could potentially break this week. Don't know if it's definitive or not. We'll have to wait and see on that one. But for now, we're headed to Iowa, Father's Day weekend, and the return of NBC, which everyone will be tired of NBC by the time we get to the playoffs, just like we're tired of Fox right now as well. So... Like and subscribe to the channel. Let me know um, if there's any sort of changes you would make to the show. If you want to talk about anything I talked about, uh, leave a comment below. Follow me on TikTok at BreakHard and Instagram and Twitter at BreakHardBlog.